Welcome. Welcome to Cucina Povera, The Art of Making Do with What You've Got with Julia Scarpaleggia and Reg uh, Regula Isawin. We are so glad that you could join us. Um, I'm Casey Highsmith, the Director of Communications here at MOFAD, the Museum of Food and Drink based in New York City. Today, we have two amazing guest speakers with us for a conversation and a cook-along featuring Cucina Povera and the art of making do with what you've got. Um, I will not try to attempt to say that in um, Italian, so I'm going to let you, you do that, Julia. Um, first up, we have Julia, who is a Tuscan-born and bred home cook. She's a food writer, podcaster, and cooking school instructor who has written five cookbooks in Italian. And Regula will actually share way more about Julia soon, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause there and pivot. Um, and with her tonight, or today, <laughs> and tonight, I guess for some of you, we have- Tonight for us. <laughs> yes, it's night for y'all, um, which is why it's important to tell us where you're joining us from in the chat. Um, tonight, we have with her Regula, an award-winning food writer, photographer, and author of six books about food culture on topics such as the history of British puddings and bakes, the traditions of Belgian beer cafes, and the history of baking in the Low Countries. Regula is one of the two judges of the Belgian version of the Great British Bake Off, in addition to being a judge for the Guild of Fine Foods Great Taste Awards and World Cheese Awards for nearly 10 years, in addition to a long, long other list of accolades. So I encourage you to look both of them up on the internet if you aren't already doing so and follow them on all their socials as well. And we'll be sure to send those out tomorrow in our follow-up email as well. I will let you take it from here. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome everyone. I'm excited to introduce you to Julia Scarpaleggia, who's indeed a Tuscan born and bred home cook, food writer, podcaster, and author of five cookbooks in Italian. But also in 2009, she started her food blog, Jules Kitchen, to collect family recipes and stories. She now lives together in her home in Tuscany with her husband, who has joined Jules Kitchen as the photographer and tech guy. In 2009, she also started a podcast called Cooking with an Italian Accent, which is lovely, you must check in, followed by a popular Substack newsletter. Recently, in 2021, I believe, Julia? Yes. Yeah, exactly, 2021. Yes. 2021. It's called Letters from Tuscany. And tell me a little bit about it, Julia, because it is... It's not like the blog, it is something extra. You send out weekly newsletters, sometimes even more than that. Yeah, exactly. So the blog is still our main archive of recipes, free recipes for everyone. There are more than 700 recipes there. And the newsletter is our favorite way now to share um, content. So recipes, stories, little travel guides from Tuscany. Uh, we send two newsletters a week. One is free for everyone. And then we have a subscription-based newsletter every Friday where we share exclusive recipes. And the newsletter on Substack is our favorite way to connect with our readers because we really get a more intimate communication. And here in the newsletter, I can really share more about my life, how I got here to do, um, to teach cooking classes, to write cookbook. Um, I really love because it's like my weekly um, space, free space, where I can really connect with people and write. And I really, I feel a better food writer with this, you know, weekly uh, meeting with people. Tell us, how can people subscribe to your Substack newsletter? If you go to lettersfromtanskani.com, you find the options to subscribe. And it's very easy. So you have two options. You can get the newsletter directly in your mailbox. Or you can go to the app of Substack app, and there you can just have the feed with all the newsletters, all the recipes. We will put the link in the chat box later so yeah. people can can yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, click on it. Well, if you oh, don't think fabulous. this is enough, voila, fantastic. <laughs> Mofad is on the case. If you don't think this yeah. is enough, Julia also runs a cookery studio or a cooking school in her home in the countryside of Siena. It's idyllic. It's beautiful. I mean, if you ever find yourself in Italy, book a cooking class with her. You can choose to go to the market with her or maybe even go to a farm or the cheese maker. It is a fantastic experience. And especially going to the home of someone in Italy is always much better than, than just going to a restaurant. So, um, we are here to talk about Cucina Povera, but of course you've written many books before that. And I want to show everyone here your very first cookbook. 
my grandmother's recipes. I hope everyone can see. Yeah. This was the very yeah. first cookbook that you wrote way back in 2010 or 11. It's, yeah, it's 2011. 2011. Yeah. I still, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have that that book anymore. Uh, it was a small original edition. I don't have it. You have that. <laughs> I have it. I have it. I mean, uh, apart from being Julia's friend, I'm also her biggest fan. So I have this book. It's very rare. You might find it on in some some secondhand bookshops. Um, it is really lovely. It's her first book. Julia was one of the first food bloggers to actually write a book, to actually move towards book writing and food writing as well. It really is really impressive. It is full of beautiful recipes, but unfortunately it's hard to find. So we'll move over to uh, the second of her books, which is actually in part photographed by Ellen Silverman, who is also here okay. attending the, 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 the course. So here we are. I love Toscana. It says what yeah. it is on the tin. I mean, this book, Julia, tell me about it. So it's my love letter to Tuscany. There are the family recipes from my area and other recipes from other areas of Tuscany. And I remember we spent the most beautiful week with Ellen going to Garfagnana and the Lake of Chiusi, taking pictures, learning recipes, learning about ingredients. So that book is really a love letter. Uh, you find most of my favorite recipes from my family, but also producers, uh, extra virgin olive oil producers, um, truffle hunting uh, activities. And it's, it's a lovely book. It's the first proper book I've written. It's in Italian, in English, in Polish, in Dutch, and in Chinese from Taiwan. So that was, you know, the first book that traveled uh, the borders of Italy. I mean, what I find with this book is if I am pining for Italy, especially during the pandemic, I pick up this book and I flick through it and it's, it's like going on holiday. It's so warm and especially I recognize the Tuscan light in, in your photos, which yeah. I find very uplifting because <laughs> the light the light light is just everything and, and it's so uplifting and it's a beautiful recipe so find it the third cookbook i want to highlight is from the markets of tuscany which is a very special book because i've not ever seen a cookbook being you know created from the viewpoint of the markets because of course the markets are where we shop julia tell us yeah so this is again um a way of traveling through tuscany visiting the best food markets. You can find uh, the weekly food markets, the fresh producers, farmers markets, and then the big markets that are open every day in Florence, in Livorno, um, so the historical markets. I met many producers. I fell in love with markets once more. And after that market, I start bringing people from the cooking class to the markets. So first we shop at the market, then we have a cooking class because it was the best way to connect with the seasons and with the producers of Tuscany. So with this book, you get recipes, <coughs> you get information on typical local ingredients and also little stories about the producers. It's lovely because and this it's is the a... first book. Yeah, it's the first book that I photographed with Tommaso. Tommaso was photographing at the moment all the markets and I was photographing the book, the, the recipes. And then slowly I started doing just the full styling and now he's the photographer. It's a wonderful collaboration, isn't it? So, so Jules' kitchen has become Tommaso and Julia. He is like yeah. the the strong the strong man behind the strong woman, which I think is lovely. Yeah. Yes, yes, and I mean it's it's it is a wonderful book, and you can still get it at some outlets, I believe. Um, but but yeah. again, it's 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 getting harder to find. So you must be careful <coughs> to get your hands on it. And of course, this brings me seamlessly onto the book of our talk today, Cucina Povera. Julia, when I visit you in your house, in your kitchen, it's always full of jars. And, and we can see behind you, there are some jars there. And it's full of <laughs> beans. It's full of, you know, if you have a big pantry in your house. So tell me, is, is that like the backbone of Cucina Povera, all of these jars and your big pantry? It is because these are the basic staple ingredients you use in Italian cuisine. You have the beans, you have uh, dry beans, dry chickpeas, chestnut flour, corn flour to make polenta, uh, all the jars you make during the summer with preserved uh, vegetables, 
canned tomatoes. So you can really cook so many uh, meals starting from the pantry. So many easy recipes like onions and anchovies and black pepper. That's a recipe to make spaghetti from Veneto. Or um, the papa pomodoro we'll be making today, canned tomatoes and stale bread. So many simple ingredients, affordable, that you can keep in your pantry and that you can really use to create uh, creative and soulful recipes for, for your meals every day. I remember during the pandemic when, when we were chatting that I told you, so do you have enough food? Do you have enough food? Because I'm always worried not to have enough food. And you told me, yeah. I'm fine. I have my entire <laughs> pantry is full of things I can make. So, and I was impressed because I have a pantry. I love a pantry. I mean, but my pantry is completely different to yours. And I think it's, it's, it's the, like, like the ability, the knowledge of filling your pantry is like a common sense we have almost lost sometimes. It's, it's a principle, isn't it? It's something, it's it almost something people should be taught in school. What is a good pantry? What yeah. are the staples and what should we do with it? Yeah, exactly. And I have to add that I live in the countryside. And for us, it's not that you go shopping every day. So often you go once a week and especially during pandemic, we were going shopping every two weeks. So I'm used to have everything that I need in my pantry for the job that I do. And also for how I've been you know, raised by my mom and my grandmother, having the staple ingredients in your house. It's like it, you feel safe. Now during the summer, you stock up everything in the pantry. And it's also important to check what you have uh every you know uh, every other not every other day but often so that things don't get bad you can still use your beans you can use your chickpeas put your bread there when it gets stale don't throw that away but keep it in a cotton bag and recycle it and make recipes from it i feel safe you know with our pantry like this it doesn't mean that you have to put their expensive ingredients just basic things that you can use when you need them and you know you feel a little bit safer with that Exactly. I mean, it is a knowledge. And I think your book is a very timely book. It wasn't planned to come out in a, in a exactly. cost of living crisis, but it's, yeah. it's something that we should all learn. And I'm, I'm learning from your book as well. I mean, it's not like I don't know how to cook, but it's that, that knowledge of, of keeping things in your pantry and, and how to keep them and how to, to jar certain things, which is invaluable. And especially when you, when, when it suddenly happens, like a pandemic but also something else you might yeah. get sick and you you might not be able to go to the shops or anything so it's it's something really important and it's common sense and and i mean it's it's like tell tell us cucina povera the way of using up things in it in italian it sounds fantastic but i'm not going to attempt to uh, pronounce it <laughs> it's l'arte della rangiarti so you make do with what you got um yeah. it's a That's tradition beautiful. it's a way of living and it's something that you can replicate at home. It doesn't need to have an Italian pantry to leave the principles of Cucina Povera. It's shopping seasonal, is uh, shopping locally, is respecting the ingredients and the leftovers. And you can have your own Cucina Povera with the ingredients you normally have in your uh, food culture. Mm. And also, I think it's a, a, a misconception that we think Cucina Povera is poor man's food. <laughs> it, it, is, it is not poor man's food. It's peasant cuisine. It is common sense cuisine. It's something for everyone and to create beautiful meals from staple ingredients, which can shine, which is, it is amazing, really, isn't it? It's respectful, it's seasonal and it's sustainable because sustainable. the fish you would buy is the fish that is local and seasonal. The meat you would buy, we, we eat meat in Cucina Povera, but it's, you know, as my butcher says, there's just one fillet in a cow. And then there are all the other parts and it's respectful to eat everything in a cow, in a pig. That's why you find recipes um, with forgotten cuts in the book that are still available, that are cheaper than a fillet. And they are very satisfying to cook, long cooking, uh, very forgiving. And you get great recipes that can uh, feed you for more than one meal. So you make a stew and then with the sauce, you dress your pasta the day after. So it's also a way of thinking of planning your meals to respect what you have and to use everything. Exactly. And there's hardly any food waste. If you live according to Cochina Povera, exactly. there's hardly any food waste. And food waste is one of the most heavy things on the environment today. So exactly. basically, we should all buy your book and all start living by the principle of Cochina Povera. 
No, you were talking about <coughs> bread. You were talking about bread briefly. Bread is really yes. important in Tuscany, and also it doesn't have any salt. So the yes. recipe you're going to make for us today has the saltless bread. Do you want to tell us something exactly. about the bread? So we call this pane sciocco, so pane without salt. And it's a bread that you can find mainly just in Tuscany. You get to, have to, to be used to that because uh, at the beginning, you, you understand there's something you don't understand, no? And this bread we made without salt. There's a legend behind the bread made without salt. And they say that the people from Pisa would put high taxes on salt. So the people from Florence, they didn't want to pay taxes. And so they start making bread without salt. The real reason is that our pecorino is very salty, our aged prosciutto is salty. So this bread is the perfect complement to those ingredients. And also, since the bread is made without salt, it stays good for longer. It doesn't get moldy. So, like, you know, see here, I have bread that is probably 15 days old, three weeks old. It's hard as rock, but it comes back to life when you put that in water. And the stale bread becomes the staple ingredient of Tuscan cuisine. Think about soups, salads, the filling for vegetables, uh, the stuffing, breadcrumbs. This becomes really a staple. And I always need to have stale bread in my house because you can make a meal out of this, really. And it's delicious and comforting. Especially when it keeps for 15 days. I mean... <laughs> Wow. Exactly. I mean, I, I knew it. I knew it. You could use it for a long time, but I really thought that if it would really go rock hard, that that I mean, I can't revive bread here <laughs> if I if I bought it in a shop. If I make it myself, that's another story. But if I buy it in a shop, yeah. you, you can't keep it for fifteen days because you can kill <laughs> someone with it. You will drop it on from the first floor, and there will be a hole in the ground beneath it. <laughs> so it it is just it is made for that. It is the bread is there to facilitate the cuisine because you only exactly. have two recipes for bread in your book, don't you? Exactly, I have <coughs> a recipe for Tuscan bread because with these, <coughs> you can make all the Tuscan recipes that use stale bread, papal pomodoro, ribollita, panzanella. And then um, I have a recipe for semolina bread. So the bread from the South of Italy. My, my grandfather was from the South of Italy. Tommaso's mom was from the South of Italy. So in our family, there's this love for semolina bread, which is a salted bread with a yellow thick crumb. And it's the perfect bread to use in other recipes that are in the book. They work better with that bread, uh, like pancotto uh, from Puglia, where you simply cook the bread with green leaves, with the green leaves and some tomatoes and uh, some potatoes, then drain everything and drizzle with virgin olive oil. You see, simple ingredients, seasonal, but it's a feast. And often these recipes are the comfort food of people because they remind them of their childhood. Maybe their grandmother cooking these recipes. So for example, for me, Papa al Pomodoro is my comfort food. And I know many people, they still love the idea of a bread soup because it's something that belongs to their, to their childhood. And so they really feel better when they have that kind of food. I mean, I concur because I remember the first time you made Papa al Pomodoro for me and for a whole group of other people, but also for me. Yeah. I remember just spooning it and just thinking about baby food. It, it yes. just, it's like <laughs> really tasty baby food. It's just, so I can imagine giving this to children and, 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 and kids growing up and, and they will think back on it. Even I got the flashback to, to the baby food that I liked. <laughs> So it's it's like a really warm feeling. And every time you make this for me, I always have this warm, fuzzy feeling inside. So it's it's a really good dish to uh, start giving your children, but also for yourself, just in the in the in the sofa in a bowl and just just eat it. Now um, you're going to make the recipe from your book for us now. Yes. But the recipe yeah. is not set in stone, is it? Because you don't believe that you know traditional everything the recipes can vary because you don't have the same yes. tomatoes everywhere. Um, this is one of the most um, typical recipes of Tuscany, but the papal pomodoro you find in Florence is different from the papal pomodoro you find in Siena, for example. The papal pomodoro from Siena is paler. It has a few fresh tomatoes, sometimes cloves and basil. The papal pomodoro from Florence is bright red, 
is made with sometimes with garlic, onions, or leeks, and canned tomatoes. So it, that's why it's um, bright red. My papa pomodoro is in between, as I live in between Siena and Florence, and my way of cooking is in between Siena and Florence. But the way recipes evolve is also based on what you have, what they have available. So I prefer fresh tomatoes, but when it's winter, I use canned tomatoes. I like Tuscan bread, but I often make whole wheat bread. And so what, to, what do you do? I, you use all wheat bread because it's what you have. And you try that, you reduce the salt, you add a little bit more of water and it works. <laughs> Another part of Tuscany, they don't use basil, but they use uh, nepitella, calamin. So it's a different herb. And all the recipes are authentic. Everyone believes the recipe is, recipe is the best one, of course. So my recipe is the best one for Papa Pomodoro. <laughs> But they evolve, they evolve with people, they evolve with what is common, what is available, what is traditional. And that's the beauty of these recipes. It really is. So are you going to walk us through your fantastic recipe? So I'll show you what we have here. Um, let me stand up a little bit. And the main ingredient, stale bread. The main ingredient is stale bread. And then we have water because what we have to do is soak the bread in water so that it comes back to life. That's the beauty of this kind of bread. As you see, it's very light, it's floating in the water. So I just put the bread here. It becomes like a sponge soaking up all the water. And then it's very important to squeeze out the water and crumble the bread. Um, there's a, I think once happened, there was uh, one of my first cooking classes with um, some people from, they were from the US. And they said, we had a very good couscous in, in Florence. It was a Tuscan couscous. And I was like surprised. <laughs> and then talking about that, it was a couscous made with cucumbers and tomatoes and onion. So that was a panzanella. But of course, when you soak the bread, squeeze the bread and crumble it, it becomes, light and fluffy, almost like a couscous. And so that becomes the, the, you know, the backbone of many recipes. And that's beautiful. You know, something in common with all the cultures, you change the staple ingredients, but the result is the same. Simple ingredients, great food. So that's what we want to have. You soak the bread, you squeeze it, and you have something that looks like couscous. And then of course, extra virgin olive oil. And this is my favorite ingredient. I cannot cook without extra virgin olive oil. And that's another <coughs> uh, thing to remember. You can understand where you are in Italy according to the fat that you are going to use. So in the book, for example, all the recipes from Liguria, Tuscany, and down south of Italy, they use olive oil. The recipes from the north of Italy, they mainly use butter. And then you have the Emilia Romagna, and there they use lard because they really worship pigs. They use everything of the animal, and lard is their favorite fat. There's a recipe for erbazzone, which is a Swiss chard pie. And you use lard to cook the Swiss chard and also to make the dough. So it's another you know, thing to remember. Pay That's attention to so what you're fascinating. using. So fascinating that there is this <laughs> border where butter, yeah. olive oil, lard. Incredible. Yes, exactly. That is something uh, I did not know and is very exciting. <laughs> That's garlic, so it means garlic. Minced garlic, olive oil. That's you know the for me the best smell is garlic and olive oil. From people from the north of Italy, that would be garlic and butter because this is what you've been smelling since you were a kid. And so for me, it's olive oil and garlic. And these are tomatoes. Um, these are canned tomatoes. Uh, I just squeeze them with my hands. I prefer these to puree because they give some texture. So I always choose them. Peel tomatoes, squeeze them, and use them for my tapal pomodoro. Now, I myself, I'm a big fan of canned tomatoes. And sometimes people will come to my house and they will see my stack of canned tomatoes and mm -hmm. they will go like, but you're a foodie. Why do you use canned tomatoes? So it's really strange that some people think that using canned tomatoes is not all right. It's something that makes you less of a, of a gourmand or a foodie. But this is not true, hey? I mean, if you think about spaghetti al pomodoro, you can make the quickest tomato sauce with canned tomatoes, olive oil and garlic, or onion and butter, again, according to where you are, uh, or olive oil and onion. <laughs> it really changes according to where you are. And you have a quick meal, a delicious meal. So of course, I try to buy 
uh, a good brand, something that I really like. My mom makes canned tomatoes during the summer, but usually they don't cover the whole year. They finish before, you know, the, the new season. So that's why I use um, a brand that I really like. And I'm cooking now the tomatoes uh, with garlic and olive oil. So very simple. Uh, I need a bowl, which is here. And now we'll see the bread is still soaking. So it doesn't take that long to soak, does it? Even though it's rock hard. Exactly. Look what I'm doing. That's the, I think, the, the trickiest part. This is the same thing you would do for panzanella, and the panzanella is in the book too. So you see, I squeeze the bread <laughs> and I crumble this. It looks like, yeah. I mean, fluffy thing comes back to life. I like to keep some bigger pieces, especially the crust. It gives texture to the papal pomodoro. Okay. And this is what you do. I remember you well, put it in, in jars, like jam jars, like, like for uh, distributing on a, on a party or a picnic or something like that, which is just perfect, isn't it, in the summer, just keeping yeah. them in jars in, in your fridge and then taking them on a picnic somewhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So look here, what I'm doing with the bread, I could make a panzanella if I want. Uh, so you uh, soak the bread, squeeze the bread, and then you dress it with fresh tomatoes, cucumbers, onions, basil, olive oil, and vinegar. It is the most refreshing bread salad. But it's different from the panzanella you might find in the US. It's not made with croutons. It's made with the stale bread that is soaked and squeezed, just like this. So it soaks up all the flavors, all the juices from the vegetables and the olive oil. It used to be my great-grandfather breakfast because he would work in the fields in the morning. And then coming back home, it was almost lunchtime for him. And so panzanella was the perfect breakfast. And I still love this in the summer. So it's refreshing. So squeeze out all the water. We might need to add some water to the tomatoes that are cooking, but I prefer to add water there if I need that. Uh, but squeeze very well the bread before. This is something really fun to do with kids too, isn't it? They can have a squeeze and they can have a tear on the bread. Exactly. It's very uh, tactile. So you get to touch the ingredients, which is great if you want to bring them in the kitchen. It's messy, but you know, best things in life are messy. So that's what you do. And this is all the bread coming from you know, leftovers from cooking classes, something that maybe we slice and then remains there and gets drier. I keep a cotton bag behind my kitchen door and I put all the bread there. Okay. Have you made this with your daughter, Livia? <laughs> Not yet, but she's too small, enough, probably. She yeah. likes it. She likes, she likes it. it. She's very picky. But Papa Pomodoro, sometimes, you know, you cannot never, never tell with her, but sometimes she likes it. <laughs> okay. She's so only three. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here I'm cooking the tomato sauce. Uh, I just want to turn the raw tomatoes into a sauce so that they have a good smell. They smell like garlic and olive oil, so it's a good smell. And I'll tell you the secret, the secret ingredient of my grandmother was for getting it in my fridge. Uh, <coughs> tomato paste. And um, so I thought that tomato paste was something like modern, something industrial. But she told me that they used to make tomato paste at home. They had a row of tomatoes that they wouldn't water during the summer. So the flavor was already like, um, it was reduced in the fruit of the tomatoes. And that would make tomato paste and keep in little jars covered with olive oil. So in her recipes, she always uses a teaspoon, a tablespoon of tomato paste, papa al pomodoro, ribollita, uh, ragu, astiu. She always adds this little bit of tomato paste, which is the modern umami flavor. So, you know, the traditional Italian cuisine is modern on its own. It's sustainable. It's, you know, it has all the flavor, the, the acidic taste, the umami taste, the saltiness. 
We don't need anything else. We miss, <laughs> we don't miss anything. I'm adding some of this. That's where those squeezy tubes of uh, tomato paste come in handy. I keep those in the fridge as well for that same reason. If you just need a little, you don't need the whole yeah. little can. <laughs> exactly. I once tried to make this, but from 10 kilos to a box, a big box of tomatoes, I got nine little jars. And that was the, a fun experiment that I won't make again. So <laughs> now I'm just buying it. A good quality, but I'm just buying it. And there is good quality. That's like, again, one of the myths. Like Italians don't use canned tomatoes. Italians don't use, don't use tomato paste. Italians don't use uh, dried pasta. There's so many myths, uh -huh. right? Yeah, exactly. We eat dry pasta. I love dry pasta, like rice. We don't make fresh pasta every day. Uh, this is the same question that I get every time during my cooking classes, because we cook a home menu, appetizers, first course with fresh pasta, main course, side dishes, dessert. And they're like, do you eat like this every day? No, of course, and we don't make fresh pasta every day. <laughs> it is just for special occasions. So I'm back on the stove. My sauce is thickening. Um, a way of telling that your sauce is in a good, no, it's almost ready, is that the olive oil now is red. And this is something that my mom taught me. When the olive oil turns red, like in a ragu, for example, in the papa pomodoro, it means that, you know, it's cooking well and you can go to the next step. I love that moment when the olive oil turns red. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I wish so I could now, smell it. Yeah. <laughs> what I'm doing is mixing the, the, the fresh, the, 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 the soaked bread into the tomato sauce. This might need a little bit of water. And then I will keep cooking this. So the water that I use is water that I pour <laughs> into my tomato jars so that I can collect all the tomatoes left in the jar. Okay, so my cup of tomatoes is a tomato jar. Okay, we cook this a little bit longer than we have to add salt, because remember, our bread is made without salt. I will taste it, but let's just add a little bit. Um, there are no spices, as you can see, because uh, the Tuscan cuisine, especially, uh, it relies on fresh herbs and salt and pepper, no other spices. And so the herb that we're going to use now is fresh basil. This is a recipe you always can make during the summer. So <coughs> you have fresh basil. And then if you want a little bit of chili pepper, that would be nice as well. You can fry the chili pepper at the beginning in the oil with the garlic. Uh, and nothing else. These are the very simple ingredients that we use in this papal pomodoro. So I'm just going to taste it and see if it needs more salt or not. And we talked about it yesterday, didn't we? That if you if you are trying to be like cool, adding more sp spices yeah. and, and, and herbs to it, it just ruins it. It just needs the salt. Yeah. This is a pure flavor. I mean, you, you need salt, you need olive oil. Don't have to be shy with olive oil, never. Uh, <coughs> but you don't need anything else in this papal pomodoro. Okay, so I'll just show you what I will do when this is finished. Basil, you have to be generous with basil. You add the basil in the papal pomodoro. Then turn off the heat and you add more olive oil. That's the secret. You must cover, I mean, line <laughs> the top of the papa pomodoro with olive oil, extra so virgin many, olive oil. So many people would be scared to add so much oil. I mean, I, I know no. I would be like, oh, is this all right? But it just, <laughs> it, need, it needs it, right? It's just, it's yeah. like, how do you say lubricant for your gut? You know, everything exactly, goes through exactly. it perfectly. <laughs> and I want to show you the final result that looks exactly like the papal pomodoro in the book. 
there we are. So you see, it looks, it, it's a thick texture covered in oil with the tomatoes. And it has the simple flavor of garlic, olive oil, tomatoes, and basil. The bread is the black canvas that really soaks up all the flavor. The best thing to do <coughs> is to leave this now aside. It goes back to room temperature. You can reheat it if you want, but then the, flavor, the flavors will mingle. And so it will be even better in half an hour, one hour. So basically I cooked dinner while I was here <laughs> and dinner is ready. <laughs> I wish you could email me, email me some. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. So the recipe is finished. That's how simple it is. <laughs> of course, if you have time, you can cook the tomatoes a little bit slower, mix it a little bit better. This was to show you how simple it can be and how uh, the simple ingredients can turn into a great dish. And I, I really wish you could taste this now, but you have the recipe and you can try to make it. And so <laughs> you will tell me. <laughs> yes, because this is a recipe everyone can make. It is, it's, you know, the entire book is like this. I mean, there's, there's not a recipe in there that gives me the feeling like, oh, I can't do this. And I mean, I do have some cookery knowledge, of course, but I mean, looking at it, it's just, it's all very approachable. They're very, very well explained the recipes so this is really is a book for everyone and it will help people transform their lives and their pantries into great food which i think is just beautiful this book was written mainly during the pandemic so it was also an exercise to do with what that, what you got because of course you couldn't travel far to get the recipes to get the ingredients and it was really made with what i had in the pantry and what i could get into the local market so it's again a lesson on how you can really cook great food staying local with simple ingredients it's true and also what i find really interesting is that we were talking about these these myths and these assumptions that people make about what Italian food is. If you flick through the book, there's so many dishes here that I didn't know of and so many people will not know of because I think it's it's mainly also tourism and people coming to Italy and just assuming how Italian food should look, what it should be, and kind of almost forcing restaurants. I, I, as you see that in, in Britain as well, I told you the story about the Bakewell tart now being iced uh, while it was never iced it was a commercial version being iced and tourists coming to that town and demanding iced bakewell tarts not now and it's the same in italy isn't it people have this idea we need to have this in italy and they almost tell the chefs in italy this is how you should make this dish exactly and this book is full of recipes that were almost new to me as well but i wanted to give an idea of what you could find in different regions of italy because of course, every region has a different cuisine because they have different ingredients. They, they've been influenced by different um, people, like immigrants going somewhere or coming from somewhere. So all the recipes are, some of them are very local, but they really tell <laughs> the spirit of a place, of a region. And sometimes these recipes are disappearing. Uh, for example, there's a recipe uh, for Vinci's Grassi from Le Marche, uh, which is kind of lasagna, but it's made with chicken entrails and rabbit and pork. So all different parts of the animals and they become a very <coughs> rich lasagna. But nowadays in the market, many people think that Vigis Grassi means lasagna. So they don't get all the, you know, the, the influences, the, the, the food that they used to use because they just make lasagna now. So even people there sometimes don't know the history of that dish and which are the ingredients that go into the dish. So I wanted to be as true as possible to what is traditional, but also making recipes that you can make today with what you have available. Uh, because yeah. I wanted you to cook these recipes and to enjoy them and to you know, enjoy the principles of Cucina Povera. Because if Cucina Povera is a way of cooking with what you got, <laughs> these recipes have to be accessible for everyone. Exactly. And it, it's not as if you are saying this is traditional, this should be made this way because cuisine constantly evolves. 
but is to show that there is something else to Italian cuisine than what we yeah. from outside Italy assume is Italian cuisine. <laughs> We, we know exactly. so little about it. And even Italians, like you say, sometimes forget about their own cuisine. I, I find as, with my own job as, as, as a food historian, I, I see this so often that people forget about their own cuisine. So I, that's why this book is also very, very valuable to remind people about some of the dishes that they have forgotten about. Um, I think it's, it is brilliant. We are almost moving into questions. Is there anything else you want to say about your book or your newsletter? Or your award-winning um, for, blog. <laughs> for, for the book, I really would love to say that this was possible because I had friends all over Italy that were so generous to give me their recipes, their tips to make something. Because of course, I'm not an expert of cuisine from Abruzzo or Lombardy or Sicily, but sharing with them often during the pandemic, like having conversations online or cooking classes on Zoom, that was great because it was a way of traveling when you couldn't do that. And so I hope that this spirit is in the book so that you can really learn more about different areas of Tuscany through these recipes and their ingredients. Um, yeah. <laughs> and we are so fortunate to be able to <laughs> read all of this in your beautiful book. Um, it is time to move over to questions. So if, you have, if anyone has questions, maybe um, how are we going to do the question part? Asking more about yeah. So I can facilitate the questions if people want to drop them in the chat and then I can read them out so that everyone can see them, especially if we get if anyone wants to DM a question and then excuse me, y'all can y'all can deliberate or or however you want. And we welcome comments as well, too. We've got some wonderful things here. We had someone say that they learned from their mom. Um, I think that was in reference to, I think, uh, in using just kind of what you have and and being a, you know kind of on the fly um and and someone else who's also teaching it to their students which is really cool um and i love this one uh comment as well from uh megan that said my mom would always add water to the can of tomatoes to get every bit out too um so that seems to be something that a lot of a lot of people have learned which is really nice to hear Questions can always be so daunting, can they? <laughs> Past three days um, with a group of people from Canada, and we had a three-day cooking course, and we cooked recipes from Cucina Povera. So many recipes were introduced to the cooking classes and cooked these days, just nice. to see that you can really make them in a couple of hours. <laughs> Awesome. I think also what, what is interesting in Cucina Povera is because you, you talk about the fact that it's recipes from all over Italy. And it, what it also shows is a story of, of a difference in climate, isn't it? Because yeah. not everything grows yeah. everywhere and they have to make do. All right. Yeah, have... exactly. You got okay. polenta. Yeah, a question. No, I, I definitely want you um, to finish that thought, I think. But we do have a question. So I'll yeah. let you finish that thought. I think that's a really cool one about the geography. Okay. Yeah, we have polenta in the north and many recipes in the north, they include cheese because in the mountains, of course, they have cheese. Or if you think about chestnuts that grow on the mountains and especially here in Tuscany and on the, on the mountains of Appennino and Mugello. And so the typical recipes were influenced by what was available, uh, corn in the north, chestnut here, and then potatoes in the mountains. So you can really understand the geography uh, looking at the ingredients that are typical. And do you think transport and easier transport has changed a little bit those cuisines because of uh, being, you know, being able to get things that they couldn't before? Yes, but also changing the price. Think about the chestnut, price. it was the flour, chestnut flour was the flour of poor people. Now it is extremely expensive because it requires a lot of work to dry the chestnuts and grind them into flour. So also this changes uh, the availability and the cost of ingredients. All right, here's our first question. Um, what recipe yep. in the book surprised you the most, um, perhaps in flavor or ingredient combination or in the story behind it? Um, yes, uh, one of the recipes that really made me think, wow, this is brilliant, is uh, in Dimino di Ceci, Dimino di Ceci, Ceci in Dimino from Liguria, so Lig uh, from Genova. Genova is a fourth town. And they had this soup, made, it's a vegan soup, it's made with chickpeas and charred and dried mushrooms. 
is a vegan soup that has all the possible flavors you might want uh, that mushrooms give umami. So really, I was surprised to realize that traditional Italian cuisine is on its own modern because you, you got the flavors that you are searching now because many recipes are gluten-free, many recipes are typically vegan. So you think you come to Italy, you just eat cheese and meat, but there are many recipes that are vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, and these are traditionally like this. Uh, so that's, that was really surprising me how modern can be the traditional cuisine. Oh, thank you for the visual. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think this is the right the right recipe, is it? This is a uh, no, uh, zuppa di patate castagne e porcini. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking for it. It was one of the most popular. Read the book out and get the book so you can so you can follow along visually too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, soup, I'm gonna soup, I'm gonna soup. go to the next one real quick. Yes. So this is a yep. comment slash slash question. <laughs> I love how this type of cooking is really a valorization of the cooking that nanas and moms do every day, unpaid, as opposed to the recipes that chefs, typically men, do. Do you have anything you have investigated to expand on that? It's a great question. Um, yeah, um, there's this you know myth of you know women and grandmothers cooking. Um, what I want to say is that, for example, my my mom wasn't cooking at all. I learned to cook from my grandmother. But yes, the, 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 the knowledge of the Italian cuisine has been mainly passed by generation by generation by the, the, the grandmothers, the women. That's why we don't have a big tradition of food writing in Italy because everyone was passing down information orally. So like, you know, uh, teaching uh, their kids, their uh, grandkids in the kitchen how to do this, not through books. Um, and also, so this is what, you know, um, I've been thinking about. You have the chefs on one side, and you have the the, nonne, the people that are actually cooking in the kitchen. But also in Italy, you don't have the tradition, the literature about food writing because everyone was cooking in their kitchen. And so it didn't become literature in the past because it was such an everyday thing that it was not you know, as high as literature in other countries. And Regula, I bet you've found <laughs> similar to you in your food history work that that shared kind of gender divide is, is very, very common across across multiple cultures too. And it's really awesome that you've yeah. been able to capture that and share with that today with us. Yeah, yeah def definitely. Gender is definitely a very big uh, issue in, in, in food culture because this, it, there's, there's been this assumption for so long that, you know, this is home cooking and, you know, oh, this is not special. While it's actually the, the food that you remember from your childhood that you grew up on, which has the most emotional connection uh yeah. and and I know everyone loves to go to restaurants and experience amazing special food which which is like created by by wonderful chefs but it's different from home cooking and it both has its place they can be they can exist together um so it's it's it, it's it's wonderful that we have people recording this like julia for uh, future generations. All right, we have another comment here. Um, I made the fresh PC is with one peachy. C. Peachy, okay. Um, my first time making fresh pasta and I was thrilled by how easy it was to make fresh pasta. This is from Ellen. Um, yeah, so I think this is a maybe a segue into a question that I had was what are some of the other recipes you shared the, the pomodoro with us? What are some other recipes that you would recommend folks trying first? Definitely the peachy, that is really the recipe uh, on the book cover because it's a um, pasta that is made with flour and water, uh, just a pinch of salt and a drop of olive oil, but no eggs. And you can really make peachy with your hands. You stretch uh, and pull the peachy. You don't need uh, tools. And you can dress that with cashew and pepe, so cheese and black pepper, as in the book, or with a fresh tomato sauce. So this is definitely one of the recipes I would recommend. Um, I love the, all the soups in the book. So the Cecin Zimino that I was mentioning before, but also chickpeas and fresh pasta and lagane, uh, which is another recipe from the south of Italy. And of course, there are, there are treats, uh, like savory fried treats that are very good, like the fried mozzarella in carrozza or the arancine or the suppli from Rome. So this is food to celebrate, something to share with friends. 
And there are recipes that you want to make probably uh, for family gatherings, like the Vinci's glass that I mentioned before, or gnocchi alla sorrentina, gnocchi baked in tomato sauce with mozzarella. Mm -hmm. And there are recipes for your everyday meals, like the papa pomodoro we just made. Or a recipe I really love is spaghetti uh, with a sauce that is made with anchovies, dried anchovies, um, so like salted anchovies, onions, and black pepper. So mm -hmm. The ingredients that you have in your pantry, and it makes a great, great dish. So these are some of the recipes I would suggest to start trying. Those all sound so good. <laughs> all right, I think we have a minute or so if anyone wants to drop a final question or a comment. I know that was a lot of wonderful information and I'm sure everyone is very excited to go home um, if they're at work to make this, you know, later tonight or this weekend. Oh, we have Ask another one. question. What do you find most difficult about this style of cooking? The most difficult thing is uh, communicating how you can use what you have locally. So for example, uh, sometimes for me, it's very easy to make a recipe with ricotta because I find good ricotta. So what I found difficult was trying to explain what you can use uh, that you can find uh, to make the same recipe. Also for us, sometimes there are recipes from the north of Italy, they use uh, a kind of cheese and that cheese is very local to that area. So what can I use to have the same result? That's because some of the recipes are extremely local and traditional, but you want to be able to make that recipe again with other ingredients. And so that was the most part, difficult part, trying to find substitutions, not just you know, for international an international audience, but also in Italy. And I think it's important because you have to replicate the idea of the recipe, the principles behind the recipe, trying to make something just as good with what you have available. And that it's okay to substitute things, that people should not be scared yeah. to substitute yes. things. Yes, yes. As you say, it's not written on stone. Uh, the, the the recipes evolve with people. I don't like dogmas. I like I want that everything is affordable and um, for everyone. So people can make the recipes their own, <laughs> and they can put sticky notes in the book yeah. to, to make yeah. alterations. And then you know they have their own cucina povera, which is the the most beautiful thing. Exactly. And then all these recipes um, are anyway tested uh, in the US in a US kitchen. So I know that I work also not just in Italy with my flour and my ricotta, but hopefully internationally. Yeah. That is very interesting, but that doesn't happen with cookbooks a lot that the mm -hmm. publisher takes the responsibility to test it also yeah. for, for the US or for Europe or test at all is very uh, rare yeah. these days. So that is, is, is very good. And also I know from experience that uh, your recipes always work and always are easy to follow because you once told me that uh, you cook and you explain recipes like you would explain it to your sister, which is the uh, the most ideal way to, to write down a recipe. I have to say I'm lucky because I teach cooking classes. So when I want to test a recipe, I test the recipe during the cooking class. So I have my guinea pigs, people with different skill levels, uh, that come from different parts of the world and they test and try the recipe and I understand uh, which are, you know, the tricky parts, the, the things I have to explain better, what could work better. And so recipes are tested also by, you know, many people that, you know, try and make them. It's so valuable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have Chef Laura here saying, yep. same here, the yep. students are the best guinea pigs. They, they ask the best questions and that is so true. <laughs> exactly. That is so true. Exactly. It's so valuable. Because you give things that. for granted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. 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 If you have the knowledge, then then you you often don't understand, don't realize that there sometimes are yeah. tiny little things that people start to wonder about. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate our two speakers for today sharing all of this wonderful information um, and all of these other things that we can go follow up with, not only buying this book, but all these others, um, and then finding y'all both online in different ways so we can follow your cooking adventures um, and as well as finding more recipes as well. Um, we did drop the link to the Substack earlier, um, but we will also be following up with an email tomorrow um, with all the, all of y'all's contact information, so you can you can follow them on all the different ways, 
Um, and we hope that you do. And we hope that you go find this book as well. Um, and, you know, like like they mentioned earlier, is, you know, think about it in your own, in the cucina povera of your own, of your own culture too, um, which is a really beautiful kind of yeah. connective tissue throughout the world. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I really appreciate you all being here and, and being such good guests in our comments as, or in our chat as well. Thank you. And thank you, Regula. Thank you so much. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs>